Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. Dan, building brands is important, especially to any small business. Jackie Dryden has a new book and great ideas for our audience. Her methodology is summed up in the book, and I love this title, Get Your Head Out of Your Bottom Line and Build Your Brand on Purpose. Jackie, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Uh, Jackie, before we go any further, tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit about your book. Okay. Uh, Very quick into my background, I have spent my entire career in the advertising and marketing industries, which... I really say is kind of people therapy, understanding how people think, and realizing that the best way to build a culture is from the inside out to create experiences, and that advertising and marketing is really pushing messages out. So I started refocusing on how do you actually build an authentic brand so that when you do start to create messaging, that what you say the experiences are resonate with what they really are. And too many companies have focused on building companies on growth and profits and looking at the numbers only. And we decided to say, all right, let's get your head out of your bottom line. It's time to look at a different way to building an authentic and sustainable brand. Hmm. That sounds uh, sounds interesting. Well, how does one – my first question that I'll turn over to Dan is, well, how does one go about – uh, taking um, their eye off that bottom line, because without that, many companies uh, fail. Indeed. I think it's a scary proposition. And when we talk with CEOs, they panic when we start to say, all right, we're going to focus you on something other than growth and profits and your bottom line. And they're like, well, we're running a business. We have to stay in business. And so, all right, we're going to put your – put your attention to it at the other end of the equation, which starts with why you exist as an organization, what is it you believe in, and what is it you stand for. And there's been a lot of conversation around purpose and why recently, but we um, at Savage realized that it's one thing to acknowledge it's important to rally people around some um, altruistic purpose or what you want to give to the world, but it's quite another thing to figure out how to structure, recruit, train, and retain, and build an organization around it. And that's what we set out to do. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, uh, Dan. Good morning, Jackie, and thank you for joining us this morning. Indeed. Thank you. So I'm, I'm fascinated at your subject matter because I've been in marketing for 45 years and storytelling and author and commentator and all kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of, there, there, there are a lot of times when the word brand is used in a conversation, but not all the parties understand what branding means. So instead of assuming that people know what branding, at least from your perspective, why don't you take a moment and tell us what you mean by branding? That's a great question because I do think that absolutely there's confusion. So many people think that brand is that your logo or your identity or what your letterhead looks like. And I like to say that you're not going to change the world with a new logo. It might look nice. But um, the way that we define brand is basically how people experience your company, inside and outside. You can say one thing, but if you're doing something else and there's a disconnect, then it will be, um, it will be the death of a brand. 
So if a company tells you one thing through marketing and advertising and you have an experience either working there, providing services to that company, or buying from them or becoming a customer, and that doesn't match up, then they've lost you. So brand to us is about this experiential piece of it. It's how people perceive your organization. So I let me let me uh let me let me drill down a little bit. Let's um let's not mention any specific names of companies, but I'll do it on based on my experience. Um big box retail store that's been in the business for a long, long time and is synonymous with retail. Uh we're seeing that the the e-commerce upstarts have taken away one of the brand images of big box stores, that being of customer service. You walk into a big box store in a mall, and first of all, it's sometimes it's even hard to find anybody to wait on you or to check. <laughs> yeah. Yet, Yet most people who work or most people who, for example, shop at, let's say, the biggest, and that's Amazon, um, will define Amazon in their customer service, the things that they go out of their way to do for their customers. And they're not actually touching the customers. They're not every, There's no direct personal interaction other than either by email or by phone, yet it appears that the, the, the e-tailers have found out that superior customer service can overpower the traditional retail marketing where they go and they can't find anybody. Or if they find somebody, which has been my experience of another big box retailer, they don't find anybody who speaks English. So um, the, the experience of the brand is... In many cases, with the with the people who work for you in the storefront or in the big store or online, uh, customer service is, to me, a, an extremely important part of defining brand. Do you agree with that or not? I absolutely do. I I, I say that it, it is not about the product, and that's where advertising and marketing got off on a tangent. That let's tell you about the product. Let's tell you about all the things that it does, all the bells and whistles, how pretty it is, how easy it is, you know, all of these things. But it's really about what that makes you feel, what it does for you, how it's integrated into your life. And if you, if you, uh, so the comparison that you made is very true. I think what Amazon has done is they've figured out what people want, and they want convenience. They want um, things to be there expeditiously. They want no shipping charges. They want to be able to find what they need. And so they're redefining what it's like to um, connect with a product. I mean, there are many people who go onto a company's website to discover something, and then they'll go to Amazon to order it. So right. you know, what they're finding out is that there is a connection beyond what the thing is, what the service is or the thing that you are selling, what your company has. It is looking past that to what is the experience of the person interacting with this. And when you can start communicating at that level, you have a much different connection and much more loyal audience. A very quick example is there are people that have Android phones and people that have the other company's phones. And it's so interesting that all of one category is under Android and then the other stands alone. And I've asked people who own the other, the second phone, if I could give you five Androids free and maybe they could do more, would you take them? No. Why? Well, because this, these are my people. This is my, this is my company. Because what they did was figure out how to integrate technology into your life, mm-hmm. not sell you a widget. Many, uh, Jackie, many years ago, I was fortunate enough to go to an executive program at the Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. And we, we, we talked about new product introduction and in marketing. And uh-huh. um, what the one thing that I learned there that has been with me for the rest of my life is that 
people don't buy products for how they're made. People buy products for the benefits that they derive from buying the products. And so marketers who sell the features and benefits of their product are infinitely more successful than people who are trying to, to say how it's made, how it's put together. And exactly. I, I have a company that I'm consulting with right now that the management is so involved in the technology, they they don't have on, on their website, they don't have a picture of a customer benefiting from the use of their product. And I keep saying to the, the founder and chairman, people aren't going to buy this because of how it's made. They're going to buy it because of what it produces, what it does for them. And that's what marketing is about, is to try and bond with the people about the features and benefits of a particular product. Would you agree with that? I absolutely do. And, and, and when, you, um, when you coalesce your company around a purpose, what you stand for, what you believe in, the good you want to do in the world, and you recruit, train, and retain people who believe in that same thing to work within your company, and you, you align what you say and do, so now it's not just words being put out there, but it's actions being taken inside the company. There's a real connection to what you're talking about, which is what, is what does this product or service do for me? And that is exemplified by the way people think and act and speak inside of the organization. Um, it, it creates a completely different equation. And then your bottom line, they, they have shown uh, Raj Sasodia wrote a book called Firms of Endearment where he studied companies that operated this way. And he found out over a 10-year study they outperform the S&P 500 by a margin of between 9 to 16 to 1. So the financial benefits are actually there. They are just what follows, not what you lead with. So if you if, – if, can – I don't know whether you for, – first of all, Give us your website again where people can get in touch with you and, and information about what you do. The website is savagebrands, B-R-A-N-D-S dot com. Is that S-A-V-A-G-E? Correct. Savagebrand dot com. Love that name. What a Savage Brands. What a great name. <laughs> Savage Brands. Yep. <laughs> So, Dan, let me jump well, in actually, here and ask a quick question. How did you come up with yeah. that name, and why, why is it so important? Well, it, it sounds maybe a little bit more um, exotic than it, than it is. It's actually named for a woman named Paula Savage who founded the company. So it came from her name, but um, over, it's, it's an over 40-year-old organization, and Paula Savage founded it. So we have taken her name, but it is part of our mantra. We talk, call ourselves savages, and we say, I love all my savages, and going to work with my savages, and let's go out and share their savageness with the world. So it has become um, a texture of who we are, not just the name of our founder. Uh, Dan, can I jump in here and say, uh, this is unbelievable. You know, uh, you know how you've come back. When Paula started out many years ago, I did one of my one of her first interviews with her. The, uh, I, I never connected wow. the two, Jackie. Um, there uh, you go. Uh, I, I had the at the, at the time um, I, I w- was freelancing for Business Week, and um, a, a man named um, an editor named Gordon. Um, <laughs> oh boy. I had his name. Uh, I, I know his first name was Gordon. Uh, um, out of the goodness of his heart, gave me an assignment uh, to go and interview this upstart woman, and uh, um, uh, she she became a, a legend. Um, can I ask? Yes. Uh, uh, is she still with us? Uh, is she still with yes. the company? Yes, yeah, she is still the chairman. Um, she. Um, She's in and out of the office, but she is very much with us and, and very sharp. And her daughter, her daughter's name is Bethany Andell, and Paula's daughter is now the president of the company. So it's kind of interesting to see a small business that has a family legacy that is mother to daughter, and that's, the, that's Savage. 
Well, please, uh, she may or may not remember me, but I did her Business Week's uh, interview many years ago. More I'm years sure than she I, will. Neither, She's very sharp. She, more years than either she or I would like to remember. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm sorry to jump in, Dan. I just did not connect the two. Back to you. There I apologize. You no problem. That's a great so, connection. Um, as, as you as you go out and you do business and you work with companies, is um, is there uh, that you can talk about? Are there models out there of companies that really get it and uh, you're impressed by? There are. I will. I'll name you three or four, and I'll I'll throw different industries in here because a lot of people think this is only B to C. It is B to B as well. But there's a company in Houston called Blinds.com, B-L-I-N-D-S.com, selling nope, video coverings well. online and over the phone. And you think that would be terribly boring. They have the most amazing culture. If you ever have the opportunity and you're, you're in Houston, they do tours of their offices, which are just fascinating. There's a company called um, Barry Waymiller. And Barry Waymiller is an equipment and technology solutions company, huge company that uh, started quite – hundred years ago and a guy named Bob Chapman he wrote a book called Everybody Matters which is about building this kind of culture Vanguard an investment company has an incredible culture of play and bringing the whole self to the office and and my all time favorite is uh, Container Store um, Kip Kendall with a container store, it's like you can buy paper and plastic anywhere. Why would you pay three times as much? Because when you walk into the container store, they don't ignore you. They say, what are you looking for? And you say, I need shoe storage. And they don't say, oh, go down there to aisle four. They walk with you and go, well, how many shoes do you have? Um, how do you want to sh- store them? What's your closet like? They start to solve what it is that you came there for, not just sell your product. So what do you see right now? In, uh, we have a, probably have a, a huge challenge and opportunity for you. We, we, we came through eight years of uh, almost virtual de- stagnation, no growth, um, an economy that uh, n- never really got above 2%. And, and we, we almost raised a generation with no hope. And now we have, in a matter of a year and a half, we've turned that tide to 3.8% unemployment and falling. And gross domestic product, it could be somewhere between 4 and 5% for the second quarter of 2018. Shortage of people, opportunity abounding everywhere, lowest unemployment rate in black and Hispanics in many, many decades. There's a whole psychological shift that's taken part in a very short period of time. How does corporate America, large or small, adjust to that dynamic change? Oh, I think it's incredibly exciting. And the um, being in Houston, a lot of the work that we have done has been with energy companies, which you would think would be the most difficult to get to understand to change their, their thinking from where they are to this new, more powerful, purposeful culture piece, and have had incredible success in that sector, which would, had just blown us away. So I think this opportunity for the millennials coming in and the Zs behind them is huge. They're going to pick the mantle up from the boomers who are leaving the, um, the, the work world saying, what have I done? What's the legacy I'm leaving behind? And these millennials and the Zs and the um, coming in are saying, hey, I'm not going to just show up and hang out someplace for eight hours a day and sit in a chair, I'm going to do something of meaning. So this convergence of these two generations at opposite ends of the work spectrum, along with what you just described as happening in the economy and that we are having hope for the first time, is this combustion of possibilities. And companies who get this right, those who get in here now and start building organizations around this and becoming authentic to what they stand for, are going to have huge success, and you're seeing it happening. There are there are some people, Jackie, who who say that that the the next generation, the millennials, 
um, are much more self-centered and less altruistic than perhaps the the uh, the baby boomers, and that their businesses they're in they're in it about how much money they can make for themselves. Uh, do you subscribe to that theory, or do you have a different opinion? I I kind of think millennials have gotten a bad rap. I think they've been called whiners, and I'm just in it for the money, and they've been spoiled. Well, hello, they are the children of the baby boomers, so um, we we need to you know take a look at that. But I actually believe they have there's great hope with what they're trying to do and what they're saying. And the message that I'm hearing loud and clear from millennials is I'm not just warming a chair. I'm not looking to spend 30 years someplace so that I can retire. What is it I can do now What is that is fulfilling? And they're demanding fulfillment in what they do. And that's not just financial. That is personal fulfillment. And when you amass a group of those people together, look out. They're unstoppable. And you're seeing it happening. If they can't find it in the workforce, they're starting their own companies. They're saying, all right, I don't see it here, so let's just start and do it on our own. And we need to pay attention because there's some, there's some great messages in the way that they're approaching it. And this uh, contrarian to business as usual is helpful. This disruptiveness is beneficial to moving us forward. Uh, I'm going to ask one quick question, then I'll turn it back to Don. Um, I, I wonder if the advent of e-commerce in the Internet, we, we, we do, you know, interviews, we do at least four interviews a week with people like yourself and people who are starting businesses and growing businesses. And the, the, the vast, vast majority of people who, who are starting are starting businesses based on an e-commerce model, not a bricks and mortar model. And, and everybody will tell you and tells us that the reason they do it is because the cost of entry is so cheap to get into the Internet. Um, I mean, I'm wondering if that's a false hope for these millennials who say, I want to make a difference today. I'll go start my own business because the, the record indicates that a lot that the percentages of business that fail uh, hasn't really changed that much for many, many years. So um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I personally believe there's going to be a backlash to the Internet businesses, and you're starting to see it, and some of the millennials are doing this, and, and some of the um, Gen Xers are as well, and it's called uh, pop-up shops and pop-up experiences where people are not going to go into a bricks and mortar and take on a lease and actually um, you know, build a store, but they'll do these weekend pop-up shops and pop-up experiences because what's happened with online is we've lost the human touch. Um, we've lost the ability to have a face-to-face -face conversation in the exchange of goods and services. And I think that there will be a, um, a resurgence of people wanting to get together. It's, it's kind of why um, movie theaters have not died. You can get everything you want on your television, on your tablet, on your phone. But people go because of the energy of laughing or being scared with a whole group of people. And in the, um, in the exchange business of people selling goods and services, that, I think, will make a resurgence in new and different ways. I'm excited to see what they will be. Don? Hmm. Well, uh, we're talking with Jackie Dryden. She has a new book out, which uh, what a fascinating t title. Get your head out of out of your bottom line and build your brand uh, on on purpose. What a, what a wonderful title! But I'd like to follow up on um, a dance question. Uh, if indeed um, people are selling now based on altruism, uh, the the economy, uh, the the environment, uh, uh, diversity, etc. Uh, Jackie, how do you you reconcile that? Uh, or do you rec reconcile that from the, from the idea that um, uh, this gener this generation uh, is less focused on their own personal advancement? What what is really nice is when personal advancement aligns with someone else's personal advancement. Um, a, a wonderful um, example of purpose is when I talked about Blinds.com. 
So it's not really about um, what some people might think about environment and that. Their, their purpose is to help people become better than they ever believed possible. And that may sound very simple, but they are hiring people who may not have degrees and may not get a job elsewhere and helping them become better than they ever believed possible. And they're helping people um, order and install their own blinds, something they didn't think that they could do, helping them become better than they ever believed possible. And when you get that synergy of a group of people becoming better than they ever believed possible inside the company, helping customers become better than they ever believed possible in, in using their product, there's a, um, there's a connection there that you cannot get in just a transferring of a good and service for a dollar paid or doing something that looks like I'm saving the environment, but I'm really just doing it to look nice on my website. It's, it, it's really a, um, it's an emotional connection to something you, that you care about providing to the world. And it comes from inside. And that, when that in, inside is unified, the external experience is real. Hmm. Uh, Dan, you get to ask the last question. Okay. So um, who would be your ideal customer today? For Savage? Yep. An ideal customer is um, our, our best connection is with CEOs of organizations because this really starts there. If there's not an, you can't do it from, from the middle of a company. It's not really not going to seed in HR or at the marketing end. You really need to start this with the, with the C-suite. And so the ideal customer is a CEO who says, I'm tired of slogging it out. I'm tired of being me too and also ran. I'm tired of everything that I say about my company sounding just like what everyone else is saying. Oh, we're about teamwork and safety and customer service. It's all parody. I want to figure out how we can coalesce around something more profound and we can build an organization on something that is actually of benefit for all of our employees and all of our customers. When that light comes on, that's who we want to be talking to. Those are the people that we say, yes, we can help you do that. We can help you not only figure out what you stand for, but how to build an organization around it. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Jackie Dryden. Jackie, your website again and how people can reach you? Yes, the website is Savage, S-A-V-A-G-E, Brands, B-R-A-N-D-S, dot com. Thank you so much, Jackie. A link to, to your website will be on recalculating.biz tonight. Along, uh, there you can also hear every past and future recalculating program. Jackie Dryden, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Dan. And I cannot wait to relay to Paula the story of many years ago how there's a connection that's very exciting. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz. I want to tell you about Bob Bethel. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail-Proof Strategies for Small Business. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. Bob Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. Dan Perkins with your featured book. Dan, today in this world where small businesses are expanding, we have Super Money CEO and founder Miran Ludic is here now to talk about new financing op options available to small businesses. Miran, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. My first question is, tell us a little bit about your background before you came, came to f founding Super Money. I spent most of my um, early career at different tech startups as a software developer, product manager. Um, and kind of got into the financial services industry at some point and um, sort of saw that there's 
a lot, a lot of room for transparency within financial services and decided to build super money initially as sort of a side project and turned into a real business at some point along the way. Wow. That's really interesting. What did it, uh, the found super money and what is its goal? Um, so super money is a site where it provides financial transparency and essentially comparison shopping for different financial services. And we list, you know, everything from loans to mortgages, insurance, investment products on the site. Um, ultimately the mission is to help people achieve their financial goals and transparently like make better financial decisions. Um, and we've aggregated all of these things on the site. So, uh, the same way somebody can go to Yelp to, you know, find a good restaurant, um, they can come to super money to find the best loan options and, um, and just, you know, compare them, uh, transparently see reviews that other people have left. And, uh, we've also integrated with a whole bunch of different lenders and, um, allowed people to submit a single loan application so that they can get in real time, uh, competing offers back real, like pre-approved offers back from lenders. Um, so that, you know, the, the, maybe the same sort of experience that you'd get if you were buying an airline ticket or something like that. Um, you know, you can, you can do that in real time with super money. And, and your website, supermoney.com. Well, can you spell it out for our, uh, uh, listening audience. Uh, yeah, it's just super money. S U P E R, and then money. M O N E Y dot com. Well, now I'm going to turn it over to Dan. He's our financial expert. Uh, I don't know about that. I've, I've been in the business of managing money for about 45 years. So, welcome to the program. Um, let me start by asking you a, a couple of questions. Is is your service tied to primarily consumers or and or do you do business do you offer opportunities for small businesses to get money so initially we were uh, definitely a consumer and we still primarily are a consumer facing website um, we you know uh, we track about getting close to a million people coming to the site every month um, you know just shopping for uh, financial services or, or reading some of the sort of informative articles and everything we've written. Um, but this year, actually last month, we just launched a, we, we took the technology framework that we built within uh, from the consumer side and, and repurposed it for small businesses who want to offer financing to their customers. So um, along the way, we sort of realized that, uh, the, you know, that if you're, if you're Macy's or something or Best Buy, you can get a credit card um, in your name and, and make a ton of money off of the interest of that credit card. But the small businesses who want to offer financing to their customers, guys like, uh, you know, home improvement contractors and, uh, or, or even like elective medical and that sort of thing. Um, they're typically charged by the financing companies just to offer financing. Um, and it's, it's pretty expensive. It's like, you know, 10% uh, on average the, of the invoice value is going um, just as a discount rate to the, that the small businesses is paying um, to offer financing. That's, and then if they want to like buy down rates and offer promotional financing, it can get, we've heard as high as like 22%. Um, and we thought that was sort of crazy. So we had already built this loan offer engine. that's integrated to all these different uh, lenders. And we decided to repackage it as a no fee financing platform for small businesses so that they can offer financing to their customers and, and not have to pay for it. So um, how do you make money? Uh, we have relationships with the lenders directly. And typically when somebody, when a loan is funded, we get a small percentage, uh, you know, origination finders fee uh, for, for providing that, for helping them acquire that customer. So all, so w would it be fair to say that all of the, uh, all of the lenders that you work with on your site compensate you in the same way. There isn't one base, something much greater than another. Um, it, it varies. It's typically between like one and 3% of the, the loan value. Um, guys who are in the super prime space, uh, like say, you know, SunTrust has a, a, a product called Lightstream, uh, SunTrust Bank, and um, their rates start currently they were down at 1.99%, but now um, they're up to, I think, 4.99 for an unsecured 
but I mean, this is a personal loan. It's a fully unsecured loan. There's, you know, no equity or anything behind it. Um, so those guys don't have a ton of margin um, the way somebody who's, you know, operating with a little bit higher interest rate further down the credit spectrum. So it, it varies, but, to, you know, it, it's typically in that range. So do people, do, do the, the people who come to you to talk to you about business loans, and I can certainly understand why there might be an interest in that because of the, the very significant growth. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank a week ago said that they thought that the, uh, out of Atlanta that the GDP in the second quarter of 18 could be as high as 5.3%, which is astronomical number. So there's a lot of demand. But are they the same lenders or are the small business different lenders? So there's, there's two things here. I mean, um, we, we do have a business loan financing solution, and it is a different mix of lenders who are, are in there. Some, of, some lenders operate on the consumer side as well as the business side, but we've integrated with a whole bunch of you know, different lenders across the spectrum. We also have an auto loan version, an auto refinance version. That we've, we've built uh, multiple sort of uh, product categories. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's different lenders within the, that small business financing solution that I, I mentioned, the, it's a point of sale focus thing. That's primarily, um, we're helping small businesses offer financing to their customers. So if you're like a pool installer or something like that, and you have a customer who may have 10,000 in cash and they need another 10 or 20 to get this pool job done. They can offer financing to that customers through super money. Um, at no cost to them, and that's going to be, you know, a consumer financing option that uh, through one of our banks or lending partners that, um, you know, would be direct to consumer. But you don't offer business loans to businesses. We do. We do. Oh, we you have do. another. Um, you know, you can go on Super Money, and, and search for a business loan. If it's, you know, uh, we're integrated with like Funding Circle, uh, Smart Biz, On Deck, uh, Lending Club, a bunch of them. Um, but yeah, we we offer both. So would a lot of the lenders that would be working in the business space, would they be fintech lenders? Um, the, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different lenders out there, but primarily we're integrated with fintech lenders because they're, they're more fast-moving and, and interoperable. And they, they, you're right. That, that's the one thing that I've, as we've interviewed a lot of uh, lenders, they the advantage the fintech lenders say that they have over the traditional commercial banks is that they make decisions much more quickly. And in many cases with a lot less paperwork than uh, your traditional uh, brick and mortar banks. Um, th there are some people who think that um, the brick and mortar institutions with the collapse of the economy in 2008 got out of the small business market and that created a, a vacuum as the economy started to recover. They were reluctant to get back in. And so the fintech lenders came in and, and expanded. Uh, is, that, uh, is that still happening, do you think? Um, I mean, that absolutely happened across not just small business, but, you know, a lot of banks used to be in personal loans. Even, I think... Uh, I think it was a Capital One, I think, even, or, or Discover. One of them, you know, you, you used to have a personal loan product. And I think Wells Fargo had a person. They all got rid of them, basically, to focus on their credit card businesses. And a lot of it, I think, was just the regulations that, that came in um, made it very difficult for them to operate as a bank and then um, expensive and just the ROI. And, and they didn't have the customer acquisition channels to just rapidly, um, you know, acquire customers in a cost effective way. I think a lot of these guys are still operating have, have indirectly been operating through fintechs. Like a lot of banks buy, you know, loans from lending club and um, you know different sources. There's, or or Green Sky operates in that home improvement finding, financing space and they work with Fifth Third and a, a, a bunch of different banks that are funding indirectly through them. Um, but I do think that that's changing. I've seen, um, you know, several banks have reached out to us. Pretty major banks have been reaching out to us. And we work with a couple, but, like, the, the appetite is changing. And I think that that's kind of, you know, like it's obviously a rapidly growing market and everything. And they've seen all the success that fintechs have had, but it's also just, uh, 
you know, the, it seems like the regulatory environment has kind of been loosening up a little bit. So maybe their appetite to, to move into these verticals are, is growing. Do you think uh, that the, the revisions of Dodd-Frank have uh, loosened the, the strings on, on, the, uh, on the banking sector? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a banker, so I can't, I can't really speak to it, but I, I've definitely seen a lot more interest from, from them in, in, you know, partnering with us. So that the, the, in some people might say that the, the horse is already out of the barn and the only way that the, the, the bricks and mortar banks are going to compete with the FinTech companies is they're going to turn around and buy them. Potentially. I mean, a lot of people have said that like lending club is one of the, the best known in the space. And, yeah, a lot of people. Have, I, well, I don't know. I've, I've heard people say that it's an acquisition target potentially, and um, so yeah, I could I could see that. But then there's, there's guys who are you know Goldman Sachs is uh, probably most famous for going to market with a, that Marcus Loans product, which is a direct to consumer product. When they've been talking about expanding into other verticals and everything, so right. um, some of the, some of them are definitely getting into um, in, in you know aiming to compete directly. Can you uh, can you shed any light for us on going back to the consumer side? Uh, there, there's um, there are some people that say that the credit card debt is out of control, but then there are other people say that the student loan debt is bigger than the credit card debt, and that's out of control. Um, is there chaos in the retail banking sector over loans? Um, I don't know. I've, I've, I've you know, definitely it's, it's, you know, that same cycle that we always see in America, like people rack up debt and then they um, kind of deleverage themselves like they did. And, and you know, I, the number one loan reason that we see on super money for consumer loans is debt consolidation. And I think that's the case for most of these fintech lenders uh, in general, that uh, it's, it's primarily driven by debt consolidation loans. So, yeah, I mean, People are, are leveraged up again. Um, whether it's in chaos, I'm, I'm not sure. I've, I've heard, I, I remember seeing one report saying that, that uh, while people have increased their debt amount, they, they aren't as leveraged nearly to the point like how they were back in 2008 and everything. So yeah. um, I think that, you know, in general, lending has been a lot more responsible in the last few years than what has happened in the past. But right, right. I'm going to I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'll turn it over to Don. Um, obviously, if you're involved with consumer debt and credit cards and all those things, um, what do you, what are you seeing in things like default rates and credit approvals and the, the nuts and bolts of that of that business? We don't have transparency into the default rates because we are just on the acquisition side of things and the originations. Um, and we don't, you know, we don't get the transparency into like whether those are increasing or not. Um, but uh, in terms of um, like just overall, what we've seen an increase in um, the percentage of customers getting an offer in the last, six months or so. So I, I think that there might be a little bit of loosening of, uh, you know, the criteria. I don't know if that has anything to do with the rising interest rates or not, whether there's, you know, whether there's more, you know, padding with that or not, but I'm, I'm not sure that we, we've, we've seen more people get an offer back. So. You, you mentioned earlier that you saw rates go from 199 to 499. Uh, uh, that, that there's obviously an increase as interest rates have gone up. There's an increase in spread, which clearly helps the banker uh, mitigate losses at default rates. So, uh, but the fact that more is more is being approved may also be a function of the belief in the bankers that the economy is going to say pretty solid for some period of time. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Thank you. Don, over to you. you know, um, Myron, uh, your website again. We're talking to Myron, Myron Lulick of uh, Super Money. 
Um, but your website again for our listeners? Supermoney.com. Okay. I'm going to go in a, t- a different direction. Uh, I, uh, uh, our pro- uh, program is about how, uh, how to, a small business operates. I guess one question uh, that's been asked by other people uh, when we've talked about the fintech is, how do you how did you build the, the, uh, uh, such a robust system that you, that uh, an individual can come and and uh, literally look at all of these myriad products? Um, I guess it's just in pieces. <laughs> I mean, really, it. Supermoney.com started as a nothing more than a personal finance blog, uh, you know, in 2013, and um, it just slowly sort of grew. I mean, we, you know, we had one part-time developer who we started building a, a little concept for okay, like let's add some company and product listings, and then let's allow people to sort of review them, and then let's store some different product attributes, like what are the different interest rates for different, you know, lenders and that sort of thing. And then at some point we got to the point where we were like integrating directly with these lenders and uh, building all that out and the functionality to like submit a loan application. And, and I think that's just product development in general. It's like you're breaking it down into and simplifying it as much as you can and then adding complexity over time. And uh, to the point where now we're like in all these different verticals and uh, solutions for consumers and then our, you know, the business uh, merchant financing um, solution that we just launched for point of sale transactions. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just built it in pieces and, and we never took any outside capital or anything. We've sort of bootstrapped this over the last few years. We, we haven't, you know, went out and raised venture capital or any of that. Well, you, you, you say that you so flippantly, yet somebody, you, must have uh, had a plan in mind and must uh, how do uh, how do you keep track of these things and decide how you expand etc um yeah i mean uh, we, like the vision i think was there from the beginning of of creating sort of the amazon of uh, financial services that a uh, you know, place that people go can go and like find everything they they need to find uh, in, in shopping for a financial service and um, and then, you know, it was uh, sort of pri- prioritizing what we wanted to tackle over the years to get to that, that spot. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we see what's working and we invest more into that and, and just kind of take it one step at a time. Oh, one step at a time. Uh, but uh, I've looked at your site. It's an amazing site. Um, uh, and you say you have um, a, mi- a million visitors a month. Did I hear that number correct? Uh, almost. We're getting there. We're about to. We should be breaking that well, uh, soon. That's that's a lot of people. All of them are seeking some sort of fin- financial, um, uh, some fi- financial information or product, et cetera. Um, well, h- how do you break down your visitors? Um, primarily business. Primarily consumer. Do you have any uh, fact, facts or figures on that? Oh, it's, it's yeah, the vast majority is, is consumer. So we, we do have, uh, within the site, we have that business loans um, vertical where we list out all the different business sort of financing options. Um, and then this, that again, that point of sale solution that we just launched is we're now attra- attracting a bunch of businesses to, who want to use that. Um, but that's a small like business is a very small part of our traffic. We are working on creating a business loan um, sister kind of site that um, would would be the same sort of concept, but for everything that you know you you would want as a business to shop for, like business insurance, errors and emissions insurance, all the, all the different types of insurances, like like you know business banking related services, financing, all of that. Um, but that's you know, not going to be live for until later in the year. Okay. Dan, it's back to you for the final two questions. Good, because uh, I do have two questions. Uh, the first question I have is um, how would you compare yourself to somebody like LendingTree? Um, I, I consider them our closest probably competitor. Um, it, it's a slightly different model. They're uh, – 
in, I, you know, I think it's changed a little bit on their end, but they've been primarily, um, they, they've built like a lead generation engine, I guess. And they generate leads. So if you submit, you know, you go to their site, it says uh, when banks compete, you win. Um, right. And you submit a mortgage application um, and that's sold as a lead to a bunch of uh, typically, you know, it's going to Quicken and Loan Depot and possibly a few others. Um, but they sell it off multiple times, ends up in a call center, and those people fight to try to, you know, get you uh, to win to win your business. And um, where we are focused on integrating with our partners and trying to create more of like a the you know, buying an airline ticket experience. Like we submitted in real time, we're integrated with our partners and we're showing, hey, you know, you've been pre-approved for these. You pick what you want and all the data is there. It's transparently, you know, you can compare your rates, your fees, your terms, payments and everything. And um, and then it's, you know, you can you can sort of do what you want. And, um, and then their, their marketing strategy is more around uh, they arbitrage advertising spend and they generate a lead for a certain value and then they sell it for, you know, whatever they sell it for. Where we've uh, sort of written tens of, almost 10,000 articles at this point and um, all of our traffic is pretty much coming in organically. People who are seeking information about a specific topic, we end up on a Google search result and, you know, they come into the site and then find our resources. Have you ever considered a, a, a business model that would take you into the affinity space? Um, I mean, anything's possible, I guess. Um, wait, it's not something that's on our on our roadmap right now. Okay, because you 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 know you have unions and you have American Red Cross and you have uh, AARP and all these various affinity groups. Uh, who are looking to add value to their to their membership? Uh, it would seem on the surface that uh, a relationship with you might um, might be an attractive partner for somebody in the affinity space. Yeah, I mean we have some referral partners in general. It's just we haven't focused on that channel. It's, we we should do a better job of it. I know that. Guys, if you've heard of uh, SoFi, which is you know one of the yep. better known fintech lenders, they they really uh, focused a lot there and and integrated with uh, I think Microsoft was the more famous uh, partnership where they're like their preferred uh, lender for all the Microsoft employees and everything and um, yeah, I mean there's a ton of opportunity there. We and we should definitely um, probably explore that more. And you, you talked a little bit about some of the things that are in the future. Where, where, where do you see yourself a couple of years out, two, three years out? Um, right now we're trying to uh, move into like the get integrated with for credit reporting. Um, ultimately we want to sort of be the place that people go to manage their financial life and sort of be their, their financial hub rather than and, and bring together all of these, you know, like their bank, their insurance provider and everything so that they can, sort of have a dashboard that shows them their financial life and um, and they can go to easily like, you know, save money on all of these different financial products that they might, uh, you know, might use in their life. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the direction we're going. We want to, we want to be the, the financial hub, I guess, to help people's lives. Well, Myron, thank you so much for your time today. And I'm going to give it back to Donna. Oh, oh, what, what can we, what can we say, Myron? What a, gr- a great half uh, uh, time we've had with you. Your website again for uh, uh, our audience so they can come and uh, learn more? It's uh, supermoney.com. And, um, yeah, for, for small businesses who are looking to offer financing to their customers, uh, the link in the footer of the, of the website uh, you know, to offer financing, and then there's information there about you know, how they can get a uh, point of a free, no fee, point of sale financing solution. We've been talking with Myron Lulick. He's uh, the CEO and founder of Super Money. Well, thank you so much for being with us. A link to his website will be on uh, Recalculating Don Biz tonight, where you can hear this and every other program. And you can now take a survey to tell us what you like about the show 
and what you would like to know more about. Thank you so much for being with us. T- tell me, Dan, uh, tell me about your latest book. My recent or my current book that's coming out, I should say, is uh, Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? And it's uh, it's really the first book written for children between the ages of 9 and 12 and their families uh, dealing with dementia. Dementia is a growing problem with the elderly in the United States and around the world. And we are very well, not very well informed about what's going on, what's happening. So I wrote this book in the form of a mystery. And I have two little girls, 9 and 12, who uh, have the magical power to be able to seem to be able to find things that are lost. And so they go to their dads and moms and they say, you know, we really, we, we, we work all over the neighborhood helping people find things. And we seem to find things. And their dad says, yes, you have a magical talent to do that. And they said, we'd like to start a business to see if we can help other people. So they decided to start a business. The two girls' name are Hudson and Charlotte. And they start H&C's Lost and Found. If you've lost it, we find it. And so they build a business, and they convince the dads to build them an office and a treehouse in the backyard. And uh, they get busy making posters and flyers trying to get customers. And their dads take them downtown, and they put them in the windows and on the telephone poles and light poles. And they go home, and uh, first week goes by, and nobody comes. And the second week and third week, and nobody comes. They're really, really dejected. And the fourth week comes, and... There's a knock at the door, and they walk over and open the door, and there's a young man standing there with one of their flyers in his hands. And he says to them, my dad says the reason why my Grammy can't remember me is because she's lost her memory. And your flyer says you find things that are lost. Can you find my Grammy's memory? Well, they don't know anything about memory, so they take his name and they go see their dads to see what can happen And the story evolves into how they learn about what dementia is and what's going on in the body when somebody has dementia. And then they decide, while they can't find their customer's memory, they can help him build the tools to retain her in his memory. And so at the end of the book, there are about 10 10 to 12, 13 things that families can do together to work on to preserve the memory of grandma and grandpa so the generations can know who these people were. Oh, and that's the story. What a great book. When will it be available and, um, and how can people get it? Well, it'll be available on Amazon.com. A lot of people who have read it, uh, who've had moms and dads that have been stricken with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, tell me that they really now begin to understand what's happening in grandma's brain. And uh, we took a a different approach. Rather than do the typical brain cross-section, we design, I work with the artist, and we design highways in the brain. And there's a brain of one of the little girls and the brain of Grammy. They both have highways, roads, but the other girl's brain, everything is green and go. Grammy's brain is full of no left turns, do not enter, stop, no right turns. So all of the messages that need to come from our brain get screwed up and we can't function. Great illustrations, though. Wonderful illustrations. Well, say goodbye, Dan. All right. Time for us to go. Thank you for joining us. And by the way, if you didn't hear all of today's show, you can go to recalculating.biz and you can pick up this show and past shows. Uh, to expand your knowledge as becoming more successful entrepreneurs. Thank you, thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. Uh, Dan, we only have time to say goodbye for, for today. Well, it was a great show, and we had some terrific guests, and hopefully our listeners enjoyed it and also got um, some good ideas of some of the challenges of starting your own small business. So this is Dan Perkins. And Don Mazzella. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, 
If you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful 